Sanchez. I am the program and events coordinator for Sandy Spring Museum. Uh, we were founded in 1981, and uh, we at first were strictly a historical museum in our area, Montgomery County, Maryland, right outside of DC. But we have been evolving in the last decade um, into more of a community gathering place. For, um, we have lots of partners, folk life partners, and Islamic Networks Group is one of our partners. And we pride ourselves in um, educational programs and bringing the community together for various types of programs. And we also host weddings and birthdays and wonderful events. So we are a community gathering place and educational for our area. So thank you to everyone who has joined us for this evening's program. Um, Women and Religion, Five Perspectives from the Islamic Networks Group. First, I'm gonna be reading a statement from the museum. During these very difficult times that we've experienced as individuals and as a country, Sandy Spring Museum too has experienced challenges grappling with the role we play in a system that benefits some at the expense of others. Sandy Spring Museum stands firmly with those fighting against the racism, structural disadvantages, and systemic injustice that have oppressed Black people in the United States for hundreds of years. The United States was built on discriminatory practices that were codified in our legal system, beginning with the dehumanization of Native people, followed by enslaving Black people in bondage as property for the financial benefit of those of white European ancestry. Sandy Spring Museum stands on land that was once a plantation where black people were enslaved. We recognize that the museum is the beneficiary of a historically unjust system. We are committed to working toward dismantling systems that perpetuate racism and discrimination in order to build a just equal society. And tonight's program is one of many programs we will be hosting that challenge the dominant narrative. And to increase the accessibility of all of our programs, um, our virtual programs will now have closed captioning. If you would prefer not to see the closed captioning, please hit the more button on the bottom of your screen and you can click on hide subtitles if you don't wanna see the subtitles. And also if everyone could please mute their audio, then it will provide for a better listening for all of our attendees. So I would like to introduce to you um, Maha, Elginati, and she is the founder and chief innovative officer for the Islamic Networks Group. So Maha, please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Laura, for that wonderful introduction and for setting the tone of the uh, conversation that we're about to have. I wanna begin with greetings of peace and um, say welcome everyone to our Interfaith uh, Speakers Bureau program this afternoon. Uh, today. Today's event is organized by the ING, uh, Islamic Networks Group, which is a peace building organization that provides education and engagement opportunities that foster understanding of Muslims and other misunderstood groups to promote harmony among all people. We were founded in 1993, so way before 9-11. Uh, um, and we have affiliates around the country and uh, Combined, we reach millions of individuals and hundreds of groups a year at the grassroots level by building relationships, understanding, and peaceful uh, communities of all types and backgrounds through our many programs. Um, the program that we are bringing to you uh, today is the Interfaith Speakers Bureau, uh, which was initiated in 2007, uh, which was both a natural outgrowth of the um, Interfaith uh, friendships and connections that ING build in the course of its work and really a recognition that the acceptance of Islam and Muslims is intimately related to the degree to which our society accepts and welcomes um, cultural and religious diversity and pluralism in general. Uh, the Interfaith uh, Speakers Bureau program specifically uh, aims to build relationships among religious communities. It enhances religious literacy and mutual respect by providing panels of speakers representing major uh, world religions. And this evening, uh, or rather this afternoon, we have a panel of Muslim, uh, Christian, Buddhist, Jewish, and Hindu practitioners who will speak about the religion and uh, religious perspectives on women's roles and rights in their communities. Um, I'm gonna begin by asking panelists a few questions and then we'll transition to taking questions uh, from all of you. And I encourage uh, the audience that is here with us uh, to write down your questions in the chat as they come up. Um, 
these panelists that we've uh, assembled are expert educators about their respective religions. So this is an excellent opportunity to ask questions about anything that you are curious um, about. So let me go ahead and introduce the, uh, the speakers. Uh, the first is Amina Janveni, who is a founding member and a content contributor at ING Islamic Networks Group. She currently uh, team teaches classes on Islam, as well as women in the Middle East at City College of San Francisco. Uh, Sheila Mohan is actively engaged in community volunteer activities and is a member of the uh, Shinmaya Mission, which is a Hindu, a Hindu uh, spiritual organization. Uh, Venerable uh, Tenzin uh, Shogi is an ordained Buddhist nun, and she's been studying and practicing Buddhism for over 40 years. She completed a six-year uh, solitary meditation retreat in 2006, and since then has been teaching at Buddhist centers in North and South America, Australia, New Zealand, um, and Asia. We also have uh, Katie Dickinson, who is the founding, who is the founder of uh, Mentoring Standard and has designed and managed successful professional mentoring programs globally. Uh, Katie is an Episcopalian and she serves as the Diocesan Episcopal. Uh, she uh, serves as a dia Diocesan uh, Coordinator for the Education for Ministry uh, Theology Education Program for the Episcopal Diocese of El Camino Real. And um, uh, last but not least is Rabbi Amy uh, Eilberg, and she's the first woman ordained as a conservative rabbi in the world. And she serves as a spiritual director, uh, kindness coach, and peace and justice uh, coordinator, uh, educator. So thank you panelists for joining us this evening and let's go ahead and begin. Uh, we're gonna begin our conversation by asking uh, each of you to provide, to first provide an overview of the main teachings of your uh, faith or tradition overall, just to put things in context. And each of you will have three minutes uh, each. And uh, let me go ahead and begin with Amina. Then we'll go to Sheila, uh, Tenzin, Katie, and then we're gonna go ahead and close this part with, uh, with Amy. So Amina. Uh, please go ahead, unmute yourself, and um, for each of you will only have three minutes. Thank you, Maha. Uh, good evening, everybody. So I'm going to begin um, with a definition and explanation of Islam in three minutes, um, which I may or may not accomplish. <laughs> um, so the word Islam uh, literally means submission to God or peace which uh, you uh, may encounter if you know any Muslims when they greet you, salam alaikum, that is one of the spin-offs of the same root silam, which in Arabic means peace. So we tend to um, kind of combine both of these definitions to define Islam as peace through following God's guidance. Islam is um, a religion that sees itself as um, a continuation of the previous uh, Judaic Christian or Abrahamic faiths. And so you will find a lot of commonality in uh, both the beliefs and the practices. So as a Muslim, one believes in monotheism or the oneness of God. Uh, the Arabic name for God is Allah, which literally means the one God. It is not a different God, but the way that you would say God in Arabic, which is actually very similar to how you might say it in other Aramaic languages. Uh, the, the construct of God is extremely monotheistic, that God is unlike any of, of his creation and is um, known through his own definition, which is in the Muslim holy book, the Quran. Uh, another belief is also found in other faiths, the idea that in addition to humans, uh, God also created angels as his messengers on earth who basically conveyed his guidance to those um, humans, uh, which is a third belief, basically, that God chose among people a series of prophets who conveyed that guidance to their followers, beginning with Adam, who is considered to be the first prophet, going on to Noah, uh, going on to Moses, Abraham, Jesus, and Muhammad. And there are 25 prophets mentioned by name in the Quran, uh, many of whom are similar to the prophets and names you will find in the Hebrew Bible. And that leaves us to the fourth belief, the idea that some of these prophets were also given a holy scripture or a holy book, which was meant to ensconce the guidance of these prophets so that their followers in later times would, would have that guidance. And uh, the Quran mentions five of these holy books, including uh, the scrolls which were given to Abraham, the Torah given to Moses, the Psalms given to David, the gospel given to Jesus, and the Quran given to Muhammad. 
And so the Quran actually refers to those who follow these scriptures as people of the book, which um, in later times people extended to include other faiths as well. And so there are, um, you know, special recognition of these scriptures and their place in, in history. And then the fifth belief is also common in other faiths, the idea that eventually all of us will die, be brought back to life, and then brought before God on the day of judgment, where we will be held accountable for our actions in this life and rewarded or punished based on those actions, um, which none of us are sure of. Um, there's always the desire that one is rewarded, but the belief is that God alone knows where each one of us is destined. And then the last belief also kind of falls into that idea. It is the belief in God's uh, divine knowledge or divine decree that everything that occurs in this life is known to God and not random. Although things appear to be random, there is often a reason behind them that we may or may not know in our own lifetime. So these are the six major beliefs, which are foundational to Islamic uh, thought. And then hand in hand with these beliefs are what are called the five pillars of Islam. These are not physical pillars. Uh, one can't visit them, but they all support the practice of Islam. And all of them, with the exception of the first, are uh, daily acts of worship. Uh, the first is more of a creed. The basic Islamic creed is to believe that there's only one God and that Muhammad is his messenger. And as I mentioned, the last in a long line of uh, of prophets and messengers. So anyone who believes this is considered a Muslim. Uh, the most obvious practice of Muslims is the five daily prayers or salat, which take place throughout the day following the motion of the sun from the morning to the noon, afternoon, sunset, and then at night. And these will vary throughout the year as the day goes shorter and longer. And these are very physical in nature. They include standing, prowling, bowing, and prostrating as one recites from the Quran. The third uh, practice is also common in many faiths. It's the obligation to share with those who are less fortunate, and this is called zakat. And this is meant to be a form of charity uh, for those in need. The amount is 2.5% of one's excess income. The fourth one is uh, fasting in Ramadan, which we finished a couple of months ago. Uh, in the month of Ramadan, Muslims abstain from food and drink and uh, devote themselves to worship, to reading of the Quran, to reconnecting with God for the entirety of the month in a way to kind of renew their faith and go back to it. And then the last pillar, which we're actually coming up on in the next week, uh, is the pilgrimage to Mecca, which is required once in a Muslim's lifetime. If they are financially and physically able to, it is visiting the holy city of Mecca, which is believed to be the site of the first place where people worship God called the Kaaba, built long before Muhammad by the prophets Abraham and Ishmael, his son. And that is the direction towards which Muslims pray. And it's also um, very important during the Hajj, people will go around it seven times. This year's Hajj has been limited to people living in uh, Saudi Arabia. I think it's 60,000 people, but from different parts of the world, generally about two to three million people go on the Hajj. And the entirety of the Hajj is a commemoration of the life and struggles of Abraham. And then lastly, kind of the third dimension of both these beliefs and practices is a, an Arabic word called Ahsan, which means moral excellence. And this impacts both one's relationship with God, uh, living a life where one is conscious of God, even though we can't see God, the realization that God can see us. And the second aspect of it is how we treat other people, treating other people basically according to the golden rule as we would like to be treated. And so that is in a nutshell, the three kind of dimensions of Islam and how to put them into our daily life. Thank you, Amina. Um, Sheila? Thanks, Amina. Thank you to uh, the Sandy Spring Museum for arranging this. Uh, I will speak about Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism is the world's oldest living religion and is said to be more than uh, 3,000 years old. It's practiced mostly in India, but there are several other countries on the Asian subcontinent, such as Thailand and Cambodia and Malaysia, where Hindus have a strong presence. Uh, there are one billion Hindus on this planet which means that one out of every seven people on earth is, is a Hindu. Uh, Hinduism is not based on the teachings of a single teacher or a prophet, but it is based on the collective wisdom of sages and saints going back to the dawn of uh, civilization. Uh, the sage, a sage by a name Vyasa, is believed to be the one who compiled all the bodies of truth, body of truths and knowledge into various scriptural texts. 
Um, the language used in these texts is uh, the ancient Indian language of Sanskrit. Uh, there are two main texts which uh, um, make up Hindu scriptures, and uh, they are the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. And both sets of texts are uh, philosophical conversations between a student and a teacher, and the student asks uh, the teacher the meaning of life, the meaning of death, uh, and how one uh, evolves spiritually. And uh, all these texts are uh, basically the, the teacher responding to the student and uh, explaining or responding to the questions asked. There are at least uh, four uh, core beliefs in Hinduism. The most important one is that there is one unchanging reality or divinity that pervades everything in this world. The Hindus refer to this as Brahman, also God. Another core belief is that life is governed by the law of karma. And that's another way of saying that uh, you are responsible for everything, good or bad, that happens to you, you and nobody else. So there are consequences to everything we do. Good things happen when we do good things. And how we act today uh, defines our future. Another core belief is that uh, the goal of life is moksha or liberation. Liberation means freeing yourself from erroneous notions about yourself, uh, who you are and uh, um, uh, what, what your purpose on life is. And how do you get these right attitudes? Uh, our texts say that you ask a lot of questions, you learn at the feet of a teacher, you meditate, and you uh, uh, spend a lot of time in uh, quiet reflection. Uh, uh, the last core belief is that the, uh, that Hindus believe in practicing dharma. And dharma is a sort of a, a difficult word to translate, but loosely means a set of universal values that, uh, which are timeless and which we all have to um, adhere to. Forgiveness, compassion, truth, nonviolence, and so on. So when you talk of Hinduism, uh, you're really talking about a vast range of rituals, literature, hymns, contemplative practices, uh, observances, and so on. There are different temples of places of worship. There are different festivals, uh, different practices. And you can do all these different things and still be a Hindu. Well, for me, that's the most liberating part of being part of this religion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sheila Tenzin. Whenever I hear uh, one of my Hindu colleagues explain, I always think about how much you know there is in common because Buddhism also came out of the ancient Indian philosophical systems. And so uh, Buddhism was founded by the Buddha. This is a title, not his name. He was a prince who lived in the border region between India and Nepal roughly 2,500 years ago. And so there are historical records about his life. And so for Buddhists, we see the Buddha as a guide, not as a divine being, not as a prophet of any kind, but just someone who actually, you know, kind of discovered the spiritual path that leads to freedom from uncontrolled rebirth, like Hinduism, there's an idea in Buddhism that we're reborn over and over and over again in this endless cycle until we're actually free and liberated from that cycle of rebirth. The uh, Sanskrit name is samsara, which we sometimes translate as cyclic existence. And so the main teaching of Buddhism is the Four Noble Truths. And so the Buddha, after his enlightenment, lived and taught for another 45 years, and the Four Noble Truths was kind of the basic structure of everything that he taught. So these are the truth of suffering or dissatisfaction or unwanted experiences. And the Buddha taught that no matter how 
you know, good our life is, it's unpredictable. We don't always find the happiness we seek. Sometimes we encounter the suffering that we don't seek, right? So we don't have that kind of control. And then the second noble truth is the cause of suffering. And so the Buddha explained that the reason for this is that we're subject to karma and delusion. So Sheila just explained karma, this idea of cause and effect, that certain actions that we do, if they're actions that are especially harmful for others or non-virtuous is the language which we use will lead to a suffering result. And then virtuous actions will lead to a result of happiness and some kind of beneficial outcome. And so karma and delusions, which we explain as ignorance, aversion, and attachment. And then there's a list in the Buddhist philosophical texts of 26 of these delusions. They include things like pride, jealousy, and so forth. We say that these are the motivations for those negative actions that cause suffering. So there's kind of a chain reaction of disturbing emotions we might we call them in kind of modern language, leading to these negative actions, which then lead to the further result of suffering and determine that cycle of rebirth over and over again. The third noble truth is the cessation of suffering. And this is kind of based on almost like a law of physics. If something is dependent on a cause, we remove the cause, we remove the result. So in Buddhism, we say that those causes of suffering, that karma and those delusions are removable through the practice, which is the fourth noble truth, the truth of the path. And it's kind of similar to Hinduism too. A lot of the path is concerned with ethical behavior and morality, mostly around non-harming. There are a lot of different uh, kind of collections of Buddhist vows, but the essence of all the vowed morality is about non-harming. And then meditation to get an insight into those disturbing emotions, into the source of them. And then other actions that we can do to create positive karma or good karma, and that will lead to the kind of good outcomes that we're seeking. One of the interesting things about Buddhism that makes it a little bit unique in terms of the major world religions, Buddhism doesn't talk about a creator God or an om omnipotent being who, you know, created the world. There's no talk about a supreme being in Buddhism. And so that's, <laughs> excuse me, that's one thing that makes it quite different from most of the major world religions. <clears throat> There's also no creation story. So the Buddha emphasized our human condition right here and now and what we can do about it and said, don't worry about how it all began and the creation of the universe. That doesn't matter. The fact is we're subject to unwanted experiences right now. This is what you can do to stop it. So, you know, it's a little bit unusual, although Buddhism is considered to be one of the major world religions because of missing these two components. Some people actually prefer to categorize it as more of a philosophy. Some people even go so far as to categorize it as a psychology, just because of the emphasis on mind training and mental training as the major practice of Buddhism, not, you know, pleasing God or unifying with the supreme being or some of the things that are taught in other religious traditions. So again, that's the basics. There's so much more to be said, but for now, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, I apologize about only giving you folks three minutes. Of course, <laughs> it takes quite a bit longer to actually, I, I just want to get it, get into the subject of women, but I wanted to also give people just sort of the context and the background in, in, of your religion. So Katie, why don't you go next and then we'll, um, and then Amy. Mm -hmm. So Christianity is a worldwide faith. It's the largest religious group in the world with over 2 billion followers. About a third of the world is Christian. Christianity began with the life of Jesus, a Jew born in the Middle East about 2,000 years ago. He's called Jesus or Jesus the Christ. Uh, Christ means the anointed one, which is where we get the word Christian from. Historically, there are three main families within Christianity, Catholicism, Protestant, and Orthodox. Each of these has subgroups, lots of subgroups or denominations, 
two fundamental beliefs most Christians share are the Trinity, that there is one God with three aspects, the Father who is the creator or the God of Abraham, the Son who was made human in Jesus of Nazareth or God incarnate, and the Holy Spirit, God at work in the world. And the second belief is the incarnation, that Jesus was both fully human and fully divine. Christians believe that Jesus lived among us as a teacher and role model, that he was executed by the Romans in Jerusalem, and that three days later he was resurrected. That is, he rose from the dead. And after his resurrection, Jesus continued to teach his followers and prepared them to go into the world as teachers themselves before he returned to heaven. Christians believe that through his death and resurrection, Jesus saved us from death and sin, and that Jesus asks us to love each other and to live in a community of love. The main book or holy scripture of the Christians is the Bible, and that includes the Old Testament, sometimes called the Hebrew Bible, which is based on the Jewish Torah, and the New Testament. Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox all use the Bible, but there are some differences in the versions they use. The New Testament includes four Gospels, plus other books and letters about Jesus' life and teaching and those of his followers. The, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, but has been translated into over 2,000 languages worldwide. Many Christians read the Bible every day and go to church on Sundays. But many are what we call CEO Christians, Christian, meaning Christmas and Easter only, because they only go to church on Christmas and Easter. The three families of Christianity share both unity and diversity. We have a broad range of practices and requirements for behavior, but there are no universal patterns, times, formats, or set words of prayer of worship. In fact, people argue about that all the time. All three families value the Old Testament's Ten Commandments as guides to right living. And in, indeed, and in addition, Christians follow the two great commandments of Jesus to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. In practice, this means showing compassion and charity, respect for life, and a concern for social justice. And sometimes this is expressed as seeing the face of Jesus in every human being. Thank you so much, Katie. And finally, Amy, uh, representing Judaism. I'm setting my my timer. Um, I, uh, I really honor my colleagues for doing such an extraordinary job describing these venerable, ancient, wide-ranging traditions um, in, in three minutes. I think we really shouldn't pretend that it's, it's actually possible to do that. So I'd like to answer a, a related question. Um, in, a, in a good rabbinic uh, tradition, about 1,800 years ago, there was what I like to think of as a parlor game or maybe a, a game in the, uh, in the rabbinic study academies in which rabbis would ask one another, what do you think is the most important verse in the Torah? The Torah narrowly meaning the first five books of the Hebrew Bible from Genesis through Deuteronomy. What's the most important verse in the Torah? So one famous rabbi said, um, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. If incidentally, if you were raised as a Christian to believe that those words were original to Jesus, Jesus was quoting um, uh, Leviticus 19, um, love your neighbor as yourself, pretty, pretty good uh, candidate for most important verse. And one of his colleagues said, no, I can't imagine he really, he really disagreed, but said the most important verse in the Torah is the one that describes humanity being created in the image of God, which I understand to mean his thinking, um, love of other, love your neighbor as yourself, presumes that you have some capacity for knowing, knowing your own needs and loving yourself and thereby knowing what others need. What if you don't have that capacity? What if you've been wounded in such a way that you really can't discern that? The other rabbi said, no, createdness in the image of God, all of us, each of us, every person you'll ever meet without exception is created in the image of God is a, um, is a more fundamental, more sturdy um, foundation. Well, I'd like to add, this is audacious, but I'd like to add my own um, candidates 
<clears throat> for most important verse in the Torah. Um, the next most obvious one um, it is obvious because it appears in different forms, different, slightly different formulations, 36 times over the course of the Torah. There's no other command that's repeated so often. It is variations on the commandment, um, do not oppress the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Um, the, as I said, the wording is slightly different in different places, but always the same reference to the Israelite people, the heirs of the Jewish people, um, having been born in slavery, having been born in oppression, and this very, very strong message that what you should take out of Egypt with you is not the conclusion that this should, we should make sure that this never happens to the Jewish people again. No. The lesson from, um, from the experience of Egypt is that you must be a people who will always fight to be sure that this never happens to anyone again. And, and it, the, you know, the most sort of famous articulation of this um, in Deuteronomy is justice, justice shall you pursue with the, with the doubling clearly um, uh, 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 an intentional uh, emphatic form. And I would add to um, the verse also in um, Leviticus. Leviticus gets, get Leviticus gets a bad rap, but there's a lot of extraordinary stuff in there. Um, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So this means a whole lot of different things in Jewish tradition. Um, it is a reference to a whole series of ways that in which we structure our religious life through prayer, through reg regular prayer, regular ritual, communal life, um, ways of uniquely Jewish ways of um, connecting with the divine. Um, and also a, a principle about individual spiritual development and, and spiritual formation, which is to say uh, you were created in the image of God, not physically, of course, God has no physical attributes, but you were created in the moral image of God. And so as the rabbis say, um, just as God is compassionate, so you too must be compassionate. Just as God is loving, so too must you be loving and so on. And so that um, that verse, be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Although it's a very, very high aspiration for us um, ordinary humans with clay feet um, is really a fundamental um, exhortation about how we're supposed, who we're supposed to be in the world. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate that. Um, now let's go ahead and turn our attention to the topic um, of women in your religions. Um, and I'm going to begin by uh, stating that many people uh, believe that religion is actually the source of patriarchy and that women are held back or even oppressed by religious uh, teachings. So there's no concept of religious feminism. Uh, that's sort of an oxymoron. So to counter this perception, um, can each of you share teachings or attitudes in your religious traditions that have been used to promote justice and equality for women? And, um, and also talk a little bit about the female role models that you might reference uh, for yourself or in your community who exemplify the practices of those teachings of equality um, and justice uh, for women. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and begin with Amy. Uh, this time. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to go to um, Amy, you just you just actually uh, ended. So uh, let me let me go ahead and begin with actually Sheila. Um, I'm going to go ahead and begin with Sheila and then go to Katie. Then um, uh, then uh, actually, uh, let me begin with Tenzin. I'm sorry. Let me begin with Tenzin. Tenzin, Amy, Katie, Sheila, and then I'm going to end with Amino. So Tenza, let me begin with you on this one. Okay, great. Uh -huh. So um, as they say, it's complicated, right? And this is one of the cases, you know, in thinking about this question about the role of women and, and the texts and things that support the role of women, I think there can often be a big dichotomy between the theory and the practice. 
I don't really blame religion, but of course, all religious traditions are held within cultural traditions, and it's pretty impossible to separate, you know, these ideals, the religious ideals from the practices of the cultures in which the people practicing the religion are living, and Buddhism is no exception. Uh, from the time of the Buddha, the Buddha was actually extremely radical in terms of his treatment of women and really, you know, affirming that women are equally, uh, have the equal ability to attain the ultimate spiritual goals of Buddhism being liberation and enlightenment. He started the first monastic community for women. You know, there was a lot of opposition to that. In ancient India, women were seen to kind of more or less belong to their closest male relatives. So having a community of women not under the direct supervision of male relatives was a really radical step. And in the time of the Buddha, there were many, many highly realized women practitioners that the Buddha really honored, including the first Buddhist nun, who was his foster mother and his aunt. His father was married to two sisters and his own mother passed away within a week of his birth. And so he was raised by his aunt, who is also his foster mother, who became the first Buddhist nun. And he showed a lot of reverence towards her. And she had many, many students and disciples herself and, you know, really commanded a lot of respect. Then after the time of the Buddha, things fell apart a little bit. And in many countries, the uh, monastic uh, lineage for women disappeared because in times of famine, it was seen as more virtuous to give alms to men than to women. So the women had a choice of either starving or giving back their vows and returning to lay life. And so China was actually the only country where the lineage of ordination for women survived in the years after the Buddha's passing. In modern times, things have started changing a little bit more. Uh, there are some Buddhist teachers and leaders who are very supportive of equal rights for women in Buddhism and, you know, getting resources for women practitioners. My own teacher, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, is one of those, really fights tirelessly and speaks out all the time. One of one of his kind of famous quotes, he says, equal rights for women is a cultural value accepted in all secular countries, you know, political, you know, value, it would be a shame for Buddhism to lag behind, right? So he's a real advocate for equal rights for women. Also another Tibetan Buddhist leader, His Holiness Karmapa, also really looking to kind of reinstate the ordination lineage for women in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and their other leaders. And then there are a lot of role models, these very strong women practitioners who kind of, you know, in a, in a way, they sort of are outside the big institutional systems and they just do their own thing. They just follow their hearts, maybe start new organizations. Many people I think have heard of Pema Chodron, an American nun who's a really prolific writer, who's very popular, interviewed all the time on On Being and, you know, Terry Gross and these different podcasts. Pema Chodron, also Tenzin Palmo, a British nun who is one of the first Westerners ordained as a Buddhist monastic in the early 60s. There's also a wonderful Taiwanese nun, Master Cheng Yu, who, who founded this organization called Su Chi, which is this huge international humanitarian organization. They send out volunteers whenever there's any kind of natural disaster. She's seen to be highly realized, won all these humanitarian prizes. So there are many leaders you know, of these of these Buddhist women leaders, but mostly, like I said, not within the institutions. They've just kind of broken away and done their own thing. But luckily, we do have these role models because, you know, there isn't a whole lot of institutional support even now for Buddhist women. It is changing a little bit, but I think it's just the result of the cultures within which the Buddhist traditions were embedded for thousands of years. There's not a whole lot you can do. You have to kind of 
act in accordance to the culture. But we do see things changing in the last, you know, 50 years or so. And so I think it's it's promising that we might be able to have all the resources that male practitioners do eventually. Yeah, thank you. But <laughs> thank it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's a mixed bag, It's uh, as, as, as you pointed out. Uh, Amy? Um, yes, it's definitely complicated. And I, I start with one complication, which is to say that uh, unfortunately, uh, Judaism has lost many women, um, many Jewish women who uh, grew up in feminist homes and societies and came to the conclusion that Jewish tradition didn't meet the standard of the contemporary society, paraphrasing the Dalai Lama as you, um, as you described, Tenzin, that it seemed like the, the Jewish texts were, were behind. Um, thankfully, that's, re that's really being in, in many ways addressed and, um, and, and corrected. There's no question but that there's misogyny in the ancient texts. These are ancient texts, the Hebrew Bible, um, was began to be written began to come into written form approximately one millennium before uh, the start of the common era that is before Jesus as Christians count um, time Th these are these are ancient times so so there's no way whatever the um, religious genius of the people who uh, wrote down this this sacred literature um, they were affected by the societies in which um, in, in, in which they lived. Um, and that, to some degree, infects the texts um, to this day. Um, though I, I learned in school that there are, there, scholars say that there are some ways in which the Bible was less oppressive of women than, than some of the surrounding societies from which the Torah emerged. Um, I, I think that's probably true, although maybe also a distinction um, without a difference. Um, uh, one example, one biblical counterexample. Uh, just this last week, we read in synagogues around the world in our in our version of the what what, what Christian churches call a lectionary. You know, the portion of the week, the portion of the Torah of the week that was read um, last week. Um, as uh, the Israelites are forming a society, having left Egypt and journeying toward um, uh, toward, the, toward the land of Israel, um, uh, they begin to legislate uh, issues of inheritance. And there's, uh, there's one family um, in which the father died, leaving behind five, five daughters and no sons. Uh, the man's name was Tzlovchad. And um, we actually know the names of the women, which is unusual. Often the, the women go unnamed. The five women stepped up to Moses and explained, our father died. He was a righteous man. He fulfilled his obligations toward the community. He died with no sons is his inheritance to pass away from his um, legacy uh, to someone else. And Moses basically said, I'll check in with God about it, and uh, came back and said, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, th there are certainly other, uh, other examples. And then there are, through uh, subsequent rabbinic history, exceptional cases. I, I can't do it justice, of course, in a brief amount of time, but uh, there was a woman uh, named Bruria, who was married to a very famous rabbi, also about 1800 years ago, who was known to be uh, a great rabbinic scholar. In fact, there's a famous story in which her husband is teaching something and she comes back at him um, and, and says, you know, you're really wrong. What you're teaching is really not kind enough to be the, be the truth of the Torah. And he says, you're right. And her, her opinion is... Um, uh, is accepted, except that later a, a story develops that... Um, she became a harlot. So the later rabbis had to rewrite her story to, uh, to shame her. Um, also, there's a story of the, the daughters of the, um, one of the greatest biblical commentators in Jewish history of Rashi, known as Rashi in the uh, 11th century, um, that his daughters wore tefillin, which is a particular kind of um, uh, Jewish um, religious object that are only uh, required of men, but that they, so they were sort of pious uh, women who defied the gender um, stereotypes. So those stories are are told, um, but but really it took until um, the onset of secular feminism. It's, it, it seems very clear um, to me um, in the sixties and seventies. 
um, in first in non-Orthodox movements, and now even in the Orthodox movement, I can say more about that in the next section or in response to your questions, um, an explosion of questioning, exploration, um, an emergence of women's, women's questions, women's voices, women's writings, um, women's articulation of new stages of the life cycle that needed to be ritualized, um, new interpretations of Torah, um, and the granting of full rights um, of Jewish leadership uh, to, to women. Um, that's not to say that there is no um, misogyny in Jewish communities, um, but it's not true. There's misogyny in secular American society as well, so um, there's still challenges uh, to be faced. Um, but but those who um, those who are paying attention know that uh, a really spectacular progress has been made in the past um, mm -hmm. sixty years or so. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. You know, because of the timing and because we only really have forty minutes left, and I want to leave time for Q and A. I'm actually going to skip the, la the the third question I was going to ask you, uh, and I'm going to go straight to Q&A, and I'm hoping that that question does actually come up. So uh, Katie uh, is next, and then Sheila, and then um, and then Amina. Thank you. So um, I had a lot of fun putting together lists of role models. I really, really did. Uh, and this is a good book, uh, if you're interested. It's called Bible Women. Uh, and it's all the women in the Bible and their stories and why the stories matter. And I'll put that in the chat. Um, so what we see reading the Bible uh, is that there is a, there is, there are great women who have been reinterpreted by a patriarchal society. Uh, and so, for example, one of the early great women is Deborah. Deborah is described not only as a prophet, only one of five women you, for whom the word prophet is used, but as a general, a very successful general, uh, and, uh, and she's also a judge, and she's in the book of Judges. Uh, and and yet the song of Deborah is all about how, what a good mom she is, you know? And so you get reinterpretation later, you know, you have the prophet, the general, the, you know, the amazing, and what do you, what do you value in her? The only thing that's mentioned is that she's a good mom, nothing wrong with being a good mom, but that's not all she was. Um, there are two books in the Bible that are named after women, Ruth and Esther, and both of those are powerful stories that reach into the hearts of little girls. Uh, and there is also the story of Mary. So Mary is, this is a picture of the Guadalupe uh, vision of Mary, the mother of Jesus from 1531 from in, you can go to Mexico City and see it. Um, but there were also remarkable women leaders uh, who, who broke the mold and reformed it uh, as, as they wished it to be. Uh, Hildegard of Bingen was an abbess uh, who is, even though she was uh, over a thousand years ago, she is famous today as, uh, as a leader and theologian. Julian of Norwich is famous as a mystic and theologian. Um, but even today, um, you have the back and forth, as, as Tenzin said, of, uh, uh, of culture and politics versus faith and, and religion. Um, there are some Christian faiths that ordain women at the highest levels. Uh, Kenya, the Anglican Church in Kenya, just ordained the first woman in Africa as a bishop. Uh, and we celebrated Emily Awino uh, Onyango in January 2021. Uh, and Catherine Jeffords Shorey was the first presiding bishop of the Anglican Church from 2006 to 2015. Uh, and she um, made a bishop out of our uh, local bishop, um, Mary Gray Reeves, uh, who, is, who was my bishop for 15 years and was succeeded by a woman bishop, Lucinda Ashby. So there are women uh, bishops, there are women leaders, uh, but you know they fight in uh, in all the appropriately spiritual ways in terms of uh, getting their voices heard, having names, 
uh, this is actually the, one of the ways in, in the Bible where, where women uh, often lose out is that they lose their names. So while one of the women prophets in the Bible in the New Testament is Anna, called a prophet, and she welcomed Jesus as a baby, uh, one of the greatest women in the New Testament is only called the Syrophoenician woman. That's actually her name. That is, there is no other name for her. If you read Mark 7, 24 to 30, uh, she is... I think the only person in the Bible who got Jesus to change his mind and to back down and to do something very different from what he intended after he insulted her, what is her name? The Syrophoenician woman. Many of the women lose their names and that's because history is not written by, uh, it's written by the dominant group and in most cases that's men. So we have stories of amazing women. Uh, we, uh, Paul, and Jesus both gave extraordinary power to the leaders who were women uh, uh, in, the, in their following, in their community, but many of them don't have names uh, or they all have the same name. There's, there are so many Marys in the Bible that everybody gets terribly confused. So it's something that in recent years, um, people have been studying, people have been lifting up better examples, and people have been, uh, as, as we saw in Kenya, lifting up great leaders who are women. And that is a trend that we can only continue and hope to continue and support uh, throughout our lives. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, Sheila, Hinduism? So one of the most profound features of Hinduism is its recognition and worship of God as feminine. Now for uh, millions of Hindus who worship at uh, Hindu temples and who uh, worship God in a, a manifested form, uh, the female deity is as important, if not more important than the male form. Now Hindus uh, revere uh, Shakti, which is which is energy. And in, um, in, in the religious context, it's sort of the God's energy. And Shakti is often portrayed as, uh, it's always portrayed as, as a goddess or a feminine uh, entity. Um, Hindu scriptures are replete with hymns and uh, observance, uh, uh, hymns and songs uh, extolling the the equality of men and women in the spiritual, social, and uh, educational uh, realms. Uh, major festivals uh, in India are centered around the worship of female gods. Uh, the one example is Durga, who is portrayed as fiercely protective and fiercely nurturing at the same time. And Navratri, which is a festival that goes on for nine days is exclusively devoted to the worship of the goddess Durga, and men worship Durga as well as uh, women. Uh, there are two epics in Hinduism, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and both these have women at the center of their narratives. And both the women featured in these uh, epics, Sita in one and Draupadi in the other, they're strong, they're very clear-eyed and very uh, insightful in their thinking. And both are pretty aggressive in uh, pushing the men around them to fulfill uh, their obligations instead of sort of uh, retrieving into a place of meditation or, or quiet reflection. So um, one of my favorite uh, stories in ancient Indian history is about uh, the, the sage Gargi. She was a seventh century philosopher and stage, uh, sage and is featured uh, prominently in many of the religious texts, uh, including the, the Upanishads. Uh, in many of these uh, uh, stories, she dazzles the kings and scholars and philosophers with questions about esoteric aspects of Hindu theology. So it's wonderful. There are just so many uh, elaborate discussions where she completely uh, uh, confounds the men that she's debating. Uh, so my uh, thinking when I read this was, oh, she must have won these debates. But alas, you know, that, that part is never mentioned. So I like to think that the, she won all these debates against the men, but it's never really stated 
uh, in any of these um, uh, religious texts. And uh, so they sort of just leave it up to one's imagination, I suppose. So, uh, so that's the sad thing that she wasn't uh, uh, declared a clear uh, a winner. Mm. Uh, so when you ask me if women are uh, held back by uh, religious teachings, uh, my answer would be no, not by the teachings, not by the theology, but uh, as you can expect by uh, intentional and unintentional misinterpretations of these teachings, uh, society changes uh, among Hindus and um, uh, others, uh, mm -hmm. a, a political climate which which does everything in its power to hold back women, um, uh, an entrenched patriarchal society, which seems to be getting more entrenched by the day. Uh, and then just your basic uh, everyday sexism and misogyny. <laughs> uh, I think it was Mah uh, Mahatma Gandhi who said that the problem is not with the faith, but with the faithful. Mm -hmm. I'd like to end it at that. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. I think you made your point really well. Um, and finally, Amina, before we open up for questions, I just wanted to get um, our audience just ready for Q and A with an engagement with the uh, with the panelists. So, Amina, right. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna start with just some basic um, Quranic verses and hadith, just to kind of challenge the notion that is often attached to Islam that it is somehow anti women. And just to, to kind of, um, you know, challenge that narrative is one of the very first, in fact, the first woman was uh, in Arabic, Hawa or Eve. And the Quran begins by making it very clear that it was not Hawa's fault uh, that she tempted Adam to eat of the forbidden fruit. And in fact, in the various narrations of that in the Quran, it was both of them or Adam who was responsible for that. But importantly, both of them then asked God for forgiveness and were forgiven. So there is no sense of this sin somehow being attached to women. There are also numerous Quranic verses that emphasize the common origin and nature of women and women and the idea that they both come from a single source. And that is, of course, Adam and Eve. And this is um, really emphasized throughout the Quran that they both came from a male and a female from single pair and that they were made into races and tribes to get to know one another. And so this really does away with any sense of both uh, gender inequalities, but also any kind of racial inequalities. There are also versions that emphasize the important principle that men and women are equally accountable and that their actions will be uh, received equally. And there are verses in the Quran that actually go through both the female and the male uh, both twice to really emphasize that, including a verse that actually goes through 11 characteristics of believers and actually says both twice in the feminine and the masculine, people who are devout, who are truthful, who are constant, who are humble, who give charity, who are chaste. So it's not just upon women to be chaste, it's men and women. And it also um, is found in these verses that were 1400 years old that the Quran actually ensured financial rights for women. And this was at a time when uh, throughout much of the world, uh, a woman's earnings or any properties would automatically become the property of her husband or any other male relative. And so the Quran specifically says that to men is a lot of what they earn and to women what they earn. And it gave women also the right to inheritance. Uh, there are a number of also uh, prophetic sayings that emphasize good treatment of daughters, again, taking into context the prevailing attitude that males are preferable. And the Prophet Muhammad emphasized that anyone who treats their daughters equally will be rewarded with heaven. Um, and then there's an interesting prophetic saying that women are the twin halves of men. Um, so if someone's not happy with you know, their other half there, they're a reflection of who they are. And then a famous, uh, a couple of famous prophetic sayings are that the best of you is the best to his family. And then he went on to say, and I'm the best among you to my family, which one of the problems that we often see in society is that people are wonderful outside the house, but then inside the house, they turn into these monsters. And so, you know, having that same face inside and out. And then there's a famous saying that paradise lies under the feet of mothers. So these are just some, um, you know, quotations from both the Quran and prophetic sayings and looking at uh, role models, beginning with the Quran, one of the highest role model, in fact, the highest role model is the Virgin Mary in the Quran, revered as the pious mother of the prophet Jesus. There's an entire chapter named after her, and she is uh, revered for her, her dedication and sincerity and her piety. Another woman who is uh, kind of um, in a different kind of genre 
is the Queen of Sheba, who is commonly known as Beltis, where the Quran describes her as a just ruler who doesn't act without seeking the counsel of her advisors, actually avoids going to war and sends a gift to her adversary and then eventually submits to God. So on each of these accounts, uh, her example is, is really uh, incredible. And she's actually cited as evidence for women's leadership uh, at the highest level. And there have been to date over a dozen Muslim women heads of state. Um, Looking at the early Muslim societies, one of the first person or the actual first person to accept the new faith uh, after her husband told her about it was Khadija, uh, the Prophet Muhammad's wife. And she was in her own right an unusual woman because she was actually uh, a successful businesswoman. She was actually Muhammad's employer and she had employed him to do some trade for her. And she was so impressed by his honesty and his dealings that she proposed marriage to him, despite the fact that she was previously married twice and she was 15 years older than him. So she was really a modern woman. Um, going on to a little later times, there was a woman under the caliphate of the second caliph, Omar, who was appointed as kind of what would be the department or secretary of the treasury because she was responsible for overseeing the financial workings of the marketplace. Uh, another woman in another sector at that time or a little later was Rabi al Adawiya, who is known as being one of the founders of Sufism, Sufism which is more the spiritual uh, aspect of Islam. In the area of what is called hadith transmission, which is narrations of the Prophet Muhammad, it's interesting that there are you know, hundreds and thousands of uh, people who took part in that, but they found that women who took part in hadith transmission were unique in that unlike their male counterparts, there were no fabricators among them. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. Uh, there are many scholars mentioned in these biographies of women, including a woman named Shuhda who lived in the 12th century in Baghdad, studied with the greatest scholars of her age and, and was known as the pride of women. Um, in the 18th century, a woman in Nigeria, Nanu Asmao, was both a poet and a teacher, but she was also a religious scholar and an advisor to her, her father, Uthman Dan Fodio, who taught Islam in Nigeria. Um, many people are not aware that one of the oldest universities in the world was founded by a woman, uh, Fatima Fehriya, who was from an affluent family and like many rich women, used their wealth for uh, charitable reasons. So she built al Kharawiyin School and Mosque, which became a university in Fez, Morocco, which is known as the oldest university in Morocco and possibly in the world, and it's still in operation today. And so just lastly today, you are seeing Muslim women really um, embracing the change that is impacting some and, and to lesser degrees other societies. Uh, one of the really remarkable women uh, is a, name, a woman named Fatou Ben Souda, who's a, a Gambian lawyer, who in 2012 became the first Muslim and the first African woman to serve as the chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Court. And she's really brought uh, a lot of uh, recognition. She's received awards and she's really uh, been um, praised for her efforts to push governments towards the rule of law. There are a number of modern scholars, people like Kisha Ali, Asba Qureshi, um, and others who are working on issues relating to women who have written about uh, sexual ethics, feminism, and really re-examining some of the traditional uh, interpretations that as many of you have talked about are very much influenced by the society at the time. Uh, and there are also women directly working with Sharia like Dr. Intasar Rub, who is a professor of law at Harvard Law School. And she was awarded a MacArthur grant to really relook re -look at some of these issues. Dr. Ingrid Matson is another scholar who was also the first female president of one of the largest uh, Muslim membership organizations, Islamic Society of North America. She served for two terms and she's now, and she's been in, uh, both in Hartford and in, in Canada. And then lastly, uh, I would be remiss to mention the fact that at ING, many of our affiliates, <laughs> people who do the same work we do across the country are women, including Sha Shaquilla Ahmed, who is <laughs> also the president of her local mosque. That's true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Amina. All right. Uh, this has been incredible. This has been wonderful. And hopefully you you picked up that it's not, we can't just look at religious texts. We also have to look at the culture, the circumstances, the environment, the politics, and all sorts of issues that really determine uh, women's rights in society. So with that, I want to open it up for uh, Q&A. But before I go there, I just want to make sure that everyone is okay with the recording continuing. We can turn off, we can just um, pause. I think it's called pausing the recording while we go through the Q&A. Um, how do you all feel about that? Does anyone want us to turn off the recording for the Q&A piece? No one? Okay, all right, wonderful. Okay, let's just go ahead and continue then. So if you have a question, 
um, just unmute yourself, but please everyone stay muted uh, just to, um, for the noise, uh, to lower the noise factor. But if you have any, if you have a question, uh, unmute yourself and, um, and ask the question. Maybe you have a question about uh, something that one of the speakers uh, said about their tradition that you want clarification on, or it could be a general question that you have for all the panelists. There's a question. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the question is, thank you for pointing that out. What can one do to further the scope and acceptance of women, which was actually our closing question, but we can go ahead and answer that now. What can one do to further the scope and acceptance uh, of, of women um, in, I guess we could say in your religious, uh, in your religious communities in particular. So whoever wants to begin from the panelists. Go ahead, Tenson. For me, I often have this discussion with my friends who are Buddhist practitioners, and my opinion is we just have to do it. Some of my friends spend a lot of time trying to convince the all-male institutional leadership to give us equal rights, but as I mentioned with the role models you know, in the last question, these are women that just went ahead and did it, followed their own sense of integrity and their own vision for what they needed to do and really just kind of broke away from some of the traditional institutions. I think we can waste a lot of time trying to convince people to give us our rights. We just kind of have to take them. So that's my... That's my <laughs> Katie? So... Um, in our church, uh, we have every three years a, a big convention, and um, we're having it this year. So three years ago, um, they had a uh, a ceremony of of uh, of regret, of apology, and of asking for forgiveness for all of the women who had been uh, treated badly by the church. Mm. who had not been taken seriously, who had been uh, kept out of leadership, who had suffered sexual harassment, abuse, uh, but also whose skills were not allowed to, uh, to come to fruition because of their gender. And uh, I think 10 bishops, including my own bishop, stood up and read letters that had been sent by people to be read in that event and mm -hmm. said, I apologize. And I think sometimes we have to start not only with encouraging girls and promoting women and telling people you can do it girl and go girl and all of that is to mm -hmm. say, I am terribly, terribly sorry for what we did. We shouldn't have done that. It was very bad and we shouldn't ever do it again. That sometimes we have to start with saying, I am sorry. That mm -hmm. was a mistake and we need to do better. And I was, I was a very, very, it was, it was deeply disturbing. The, the letters were very specific and, and yet it was cleansing and, and strengthening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Amy? Uh, that's an incredible story, um, Katie. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that have been most successful in the Jewish community um, include uh, there are several organizations that have been set up to document the inequities um, in terms of how many women get jobs of uh, how many women of equal um, experience and qualifications get jobs and don't get jobs, how much women get paid, uh, which Jewish organizations, how many women um, ascend to be chosen as leaders to, to various um, organizations. And when when that material, when those data came out, um, mm -hmm. Very, very clear. You could see what the what the truth was. Um, there's a lot of work going on with rabbinic search committees. That is, with lay people, when a synagogue is uh, interviewing rabbis, male and female. Um, still to this day, in the 21st century, the rabbinic um, search committees asking about asking things that are blatantly illegal, not not to mention um, unethical. Uh, how are you going to have your babies if you take this job and how long and, and, and so on. Um, so there's a lot of education to be done there. The problem is the rabbinic search committees 
cycle through. So it can be different, you know, three years from now, it could be uh, another group. And there's a lot of work um, with empowering women. Um, why do women rabbis get paid uh, substantially less? I mean, why do women professionals mm-hmm. get paid substantially less? They're, it's complicated, right? Mm-hmm. Because we still live in a um, in a society with a lot of sexism um, in it. But some sometimes women don't feel empowered to ask for what they're worth. So there's some empowerment training going on um, with rab- women rabbis in particular. And just finally, um, in uh, recent years, very recent years, there's been a lot of work um, documenting and surfacing incidents of sexual harassment and insult and assault mm-hmm. against women leaders and particularly women rabbis. And um, it parallels the Me Too um, movement. It's heartbreaking. And this is how we make change. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sheila and Amina, do you want to do you want to comment about this? I'm especially interested in religious leadership, right? We have you know, we definitely have the scholars in in your communities, but religious leadership in the mosque, religious leadership in Hindu temples, um, we're seeing it, of course, in the Christian, not so much in the Catholic uh, tradition. And I really want Katie to actually talk a little bit about that as much as you're able to, because I know that you're Protestant. I mean, we're clearly seeing it in the Jewish and in the Buddhist tradition. Both of the ladies that are here representing those traditions are actually religious leaders in their communities. But um, where, where is that going in the Hindu, Muslim, and in the Catholic tradition? Uh, Katie, if you can comment on that. But let's begin with... Sheila, do you want to go first, or Amina? Okay. Sheila? Uh, uh, so I just wanted to bring up the example of uh, the Chinmaya mission that I'm associated with. Uh, it has many uh, centers in, uh, in the United States as well as uh, in other parts of the world. And these are led by women, uh, women teachers, women scholars. And, um, uh, and, and these teachers, not just, they're not there just to provide instructions or give lectures. Or, or talk, but they are involved in, this, uh, in the community activities of the center, uh, centers uh, where they're located. And uh, we have many examples where they're operating clinics, food banks, schools, and so on. And um, the center that I belong to in San Jose, California, has, um, has a robust uh, meal preparation program for the homeless. It provides sleeping bags for, uh, for low-income families during the winter months. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, activity uh, led by uh, women, and um, you know I have to give credit to the, to the younger uh, younger members of the organization. They are less uh, uh, entrenched in, in old traditions, and they are willing to sort of expand their horizons and and sort of uh, um, uh, you know sort of look at it from a, a, a slightly uh, different perspective in, in terms of uh, community. Um, and not just in terms of uh, the religious uh, path they're following. Um, so, so there is a lot of, uh, in recent years, a lot has been accomplished. But I, uh, I had a sort of an, an interesting story. There is, uh, in Northern California, in San Ramon, uh, there is um, a monastery led by a female spiritual leader, uh, and she's known as Amma. And Amma is a word uh, saying mother, uh, which means mother. She's also... Uh, known as the, the hugging Amma. And she really believes, and this is sort of pre-pandemic, I'm assuming, she would uh, physically hug every devotee that, that uh, came, came to see her. And she, she believed that uh, she, she saw herself as a spiritual uh, therapist. And um, you know, lots of people who had no faith in any of this were, were kind of touched by uh, what she did. But her, she has a foundation which is amazingly successful raised millions of dollars for good causes, hospitals, schools, um, housing, housing for the poor, and so on. And um, the story is when uh, the tsunami hit parts of uh, India in 2004 or 2005, um, the governments of three different countries, they took uh, five days to even come up with a plan. And by the time they came up with a plan, uh, Amma's operation had, organization had already provided food and shelter to 60,000 people within uh, five hours. So that's that's the, the power she is able to sort of generate. So um, we, we do have someone similar to that here in the Bay Area, an old friend of mine in Maha's, uh, Habiba Hussein. She started mm-hmm. a charity um, a couple of decades ago called Rahima Foundation. Rahima means mercy 
and they provide food and other necessities to, to people in need. And it's really expanded over the years. And she's been working very quietly. I think one of the unique qualities of women is that they just work quietly with a lot, a lot, a lot of fanfare. And sometimes, you know, one of the challenges in Islam and probably other faiths is that you are supposed to be kind of humble um, and not brag about what you're doing. How, does that then turn into you're being ignored? Uh, yes. <laughs> and you're not given you're not given credit for all the work you do. So I would say a lot of mosques do run on the backs of women, whether it's running the, the Sunday school, running the full-time school, you know, a lot of the principles of full-time Islamic schools are women running uh, charitable, you know, food, food kitchens, um, you know, ex external projects. And yet they may not get that recognition or they may not got the leadership leadership. We are seeing more women on boards of mosques, even heads of mosques, but certainly not mm -hmm. in a way that is equitable or that is reflective of how much work they're doing. And, and part of the problem is I think that um, kind of innate women just are doers and to some degree, but it also is just tradition. Um, and so I think with the new generation, they're out there doing amazing things and they don't really care that much. And it's, and they're, they're really achieving a lot of things. So I think one thing women can do is really just support each other. Uh, because a lot of times I think, and this is not just women, any kind of marginalized community, they're just so uh, eager for access that they don't always support each other. And especially supporting people that are maybe new, you know, coming mm -hmm. up, uh, giving them a, a, a voice and you know, taking a back seat, mm -hmm. which it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes because you've worked so hard to get that position. Mm -hmm. Amina, why don't you say a, little, a few words about the women, uh, women religious leaders that ha have developed their own groups? Yeah, um, yeah. One of the women I didn't have a chance to mention is a ba another Bear Air leader um, named uh, Rani Awad, and she, her bio is just incredible because she's a clinical professor of psychiatry at Stanford. Mm -hmm. She's the director of the Stanford Muslim Mental Health Lab. Mm -hmm. um, she's an instructor at a Muslim college, formerly at Zaytuna College. Works for Yakin Isbu, mm -hmm. but she also has started an organization called the Rahma Foundation, which serves uh, Muslim women and girls. And so they bring in these Muslim scholars to give talks on all sorts of, of, of topics. They have uh, every um, Friday, they have a meeting via Zoom. In Ramadan, they have meetings every night. Via, it's just mm -hmm. it's just a powerhouse. Uh, and, and, this a is one of, yeah. and this is one of many different yes. uh, groups that have just you the know, they, you know, uh, done what Tenzin was talking about is just went out and did it. They and they have developed their own following, their own group, um, and thousands of people follow them. Uh, and they are religious leaders uh, in in our communities. Katie, do you want to comment on Catholicism for a second? And then I have two other questions, and we only have ten minutes left, so you really have to make it short. Okay? There's a question here um, about uh, untying misogyny uh, from religion where it exists. And I, I also wanted you to sort of reflect, whoever wants to respond to the question, what can interfaith, what can the interfaith space do to help um, raise the status of women? But like can Muslims uh, benefit from our interactions with Jewish uh, religious leaders or Buddhist religious leaders, you know, and so forth? I, what do you, do you have a vision for that at all? Could that, could this possibly happen where you know Muslims could be influenced for example by what's happening in other communities and or Hindus by other communities and so forth so um, so those are two questions and then uh, yeah mm -hmm. so, um, so I put a, a fun video in the chat uh, called ordain a lady uh, which is from women uh, Catholics who want to be ordained and having just finished my master's at Graduate Theological Union there are a lot of Catholic women uh, who are getting their uh, MDivs, uh, Masters of Divinity, uh, for the preparing for the time when they can uh, become Catholic uh, clergy. Um, it's going to be a long haul, but when I took a class uh, from the Jesuit school at uh, Graduate Theological Union, my, the theologian who taught it was a woman. They have a lot of women yeah. theologians. I think what, you know, putting women, allowing talented, capable, intelligent, well-educated women to take the positions uh, that, uh, that are uh, commensurate with their skills and capabilities, and then uh, seeking to support them is just something, it's the work of generations. Uh, and Catholicism having a very strong patriarchal hierarchy, it's going to take longer uh, than some of the rest of the Christian world, which is 
you know, we're smaller, we're less organized, we're more quarrelsome, so we're more likely to accept change. Mm -hmm. But um, but I have been encouraged by what Pope Francis has said from time to time, and I think it may be the work of his lifetime to make this change. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katie. I want Tenson to respond to the question that was asked in the chat. And I just want uh, Amy, and it's in response to the question, is it important to see women in the front of the congregation giving sermons and leading? I mean, how important is that? Because oftentimes uh, Muslims will say, well, it's not important you know, for to have women necessarily lead the prayer or give the sermon. That's, that's not where you find leadership. But I just wanted Amy to comment about is it important or not? But Tenzin, go ahead first and just respond to the question, which is in response to other questions as well. <laughs> so reiterate the question that you'd like me to respond to. I oh, it's in, the, it's, in the it, it's, okay. in it's in the chat. It's in the chat. It's in the chat. I'm sorry. Um, uh, so uh, Lisa's asking, she's saying that I'm hearing what is already being done and what can be done. But the only answer I heard from Tenzin, who said basically, go ahead and take, uh, take the lead role. Um, right. So that, that was kind of what I was saying, you know, if we wait for permission from, you know, I think, you know, the, the group that has power is always very reluctant to give any of their power to the powerless. And so, mm -hmm. you know, my idea is we just do it, you know, we just go ahead and, and maybe start our or own organizations, like a lot of the role models. Yeah. I've done in Buddhism. I think it is important. I've noticed for myself, I don't think of it when I teach, but often, especially young women will come up to me after a teaching or retreat that I've led and said, oh, I've only ever gotten Buddhist teachings from men. It's so amazing to get yeah. Buddhist teachings from a woman. You know, and I don't think of it, I just am kind of doing my thing, but as a representation, not out of any hubris, because of course in Buddhism, we're also encouraged to be humble. Like Amina said, there's always this sort of, you know, we're meant to be really humble, but does that mean that we're not kind of taking our rightful place because sometimes we have to struggle for it? So there's a tension there. But I think it is important because that's the feedback that I get. Mm -hmm. Amy, did you want to comment? Um, yeah, that's my experience too. I mean, first, I want to say that there are many, many ways to be a leader uh, in society, in life. And, and any time you don't you don't need a degree on your wall or necessarily need a a, um, a title, uh, so to really acknowledge how how many women and men serve as leaders and and are not recognized for it, but but people know the work they do in the community. But that said, there's no question but that seeing women in leadership, uh, particularly in houses of worship, is profound. And I think that's primarily in my experience, and I've been a rabbi now for 36 years, um, uh, for, for a couple of reasons. W one is uh, for the young people, um, for the young people, especially the young women, the girls who come up and say, oh, I never saw a woman rabbi before. And uh, but just the other day, I heard someone, a w woman rabbi say that she's a rabbi because of me, because she she learned of my ordination at a certain time in, in, in her life. So we encourage one another. Um, and, and to actually see it up front um, places, it makes it a reality in the in the heart of the um, of of the child, also in the heart of the older woman or older man who thought they were resistant to this and thought that um, ordination women is such a such a, a um, uh, foundational change in the tradition. It's an assault to the, to the tradition. Don't you love the tradition? Why do you want to make so much change? You're tearing us apart. Somehow those ideas I've heard umpteen times that when I or another woman stood up uh, uh, on the pulpit, people would say afterwards, you know, is always really, really opposed to the ordination of women, but like, you're not so bad that, that somehow seeing us as individuals made it less scary. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there was one other thing. Um, 
There's one other thing I wanted to say, but I'm not remembering. Um, just a word about humility. Humility is a profoundly important value um, in, in Jewish text and Jewish life as well. Um, and when I teach humility, I regularly hear from women, or sometimes if a, if a student doesn't bring it up, I have to bring it up. We live in a society still in the 21st century that teaches women not to take up too much space. <laughs> teachings about humility re resonate differently with women, land differently on women. I often have um, uh, women participants in my classes who say, wait a second, we're taught all the time to be humble and not to, and to be nice and to let other people go ahead. Shouldn't our tradition be teaching us how to be strong in a righteous way? And so it's complicated, it's, mm -hmm. it's both and I continue to teach humility, uh, particularly mm -hmm. because it's so countercultural in this context, but we need to be aware mm -hmm. that um, there's a there's a misogynistic form of humility mm -hmm. that applies specifically to women, and so uh, it's a it's a very tricky thing to na to navigate in mm -hmm. our uh, individual spiritual lives and in our leadership. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, anyone else wants to make a closing comment? Amina, Katie, I see your hands are up. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say that uh, so as a jail chaplain, um, I am not. Uh, I'm not told I can only go into the women's side in the jail. I go into the men's side. I mostly go into the men's side. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was actually started when we had the head chaplain was a male. The head chaplain is now a female. And I think it makes a difference, you know, if 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 you are if you are serving a population and they see you doing the work, you know, even if you're supporting men, whether you're supporting women, that <coughs> just women supporting women, that men, ha you have to be able to support humans, regardless of what flavors they come in. And that the, um, the way that you do it is what is important, not, you know, how you were born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, anyone else? Amina, um, uh, Sheila, uh, I would say that, yeah, do do things with sincerity and you will get that recognition. Um, as I think Tenzin mentioned, you know, don't wait for someone to say if you can or cannot do something, do it and, and they'll come later. And, and we've seen that through ING, the work of ING. You know, when we first started, there were very few women uh, speaking in mosque, very few women leaders. And of course, it's become mm -hmm. much more normative now, but I think we may have helped open that door. Um, I don't know if people tell you that all the time, Maha, like, oh, you did this, oh, I, I, you at that. I and, absolutely think so. Yeah. I used to hear comments like, you know, sister, you need to be home, married, with kids. What are you doing out here? Join the women's committee. And I always ask them, what, do the, what, what does the women committee do? Well, they cook, they clean, they take care of kids. Um, <laughs> I come from a corporate background. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> time I wasn't was married, I, and I didn't cook so you know and definitely it was incredibly challenging starting out but today I would say half of the new Muslim American organizations have been are founded by women I mean women I think there are more women now that run things I than there so. are in my community and there's yeah. a lot more women running for government making it into like Congress making it to the White House that it women are just a long nice. way and you know, on the interfaith uh, contribution, I I often cite uh, Jewish, um, you know, uh, experiences that I've had to say I wish we could do the same thing. You know, women, uh, you know, not don't necessarily have to give a sermon, but they can still get up and give a teaching of some kind, right? Until that change happens, which is going to happen over generations. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. But I often cite the example of Jewish women uh, doing the great work that they do in religious communities. Amy, you wanted to say something really quick? Yeah, at the risk of dropping, dropping a bombshell at the very uh, end. Oh, no. <laughs> the other thing that's been really, really important in the 60 year history of um, Jewish feminism um, is that um, when people saw, in the days when people saw only males on, on the raised platform on the pulpit, mm -hmm. it, it reinforced the very, very common and actually idolatrous notion mm -hmm. that God is male. Yeah. And when women began to rise onto those pulpits, it mm -hmm. shook. I mean, there's also a lot of explicit writing in the in in Jewish mm -hmm. feminist communities that that unpacked the mm -hmm. the absurdity and really the offensiveness of the idea that you know that to, of taking the metaphors of God as Father and King and so on. Um, yeah. so that somehow to seeing a woman up there mm -hmm. um, 
rearranged a lot of the internal uh, me mental spiritual furniture in, in people's mm -hmm. lives in a way, quite aside from feminism, that, that was really useful and creative um, mm -hmm. in, our, in our community theologically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we haven't even talked or touched on the differences between women's perspective on scripture versus male perspectives on scriptures and what that brings uh, to the community. But we're going to have to end here out of respect for your time. It's 8.30 your time. It's only 5.30 our time uh, in, uh, you know, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I want to thank all the speakers for their presentations. And I want to thank the audience for engaging with us and and uh, my, our hope is that this was informative and it's just the start of a, of, a, of, a, of a long conversation. And so now I want to turn it back to our host, uh, Laura. Uh, okay. To go ahead and close this for us. So. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to thank the five panelists for doing such a great job and especially to Maha for putting forth the questions that enabled the panelists to describe their face and the, and the women who were the role models and then for the great Q&A that wrapped up the whole evening. And especially to everyone in our Sandy Spring Museum community who came and attended the program. So thank you to everyone. Um, if anyone's gonna be in the area, please come to the Sandy Spring Museum. We have our brand new Shino pottery exhibit, which is the pottery with the Japanese based Shino glaze. And we have our ongoing exhibit, I Am More Than My Hair, which are beautiful photographs of women with who have lost their hair and the stories behind those photographs. And both of those exhibits go through the summer. And if you want to read anything about our exhibits and programs, please go to our website, sandyspringmuseum.org. So thanks again to everyone who came to the program.